Okay, thank you for the invitation and uh, for the introduction. Uh, so yeah, I wanted to talk to you guys today. Yeah, let me just check the time. Okay. Uh, about uh, some work that I did uh, with my uh, PhD students. Uh, yeah, on uh, on interdiction problems, um, and it's just like our first work on on these types of problems. I just wanted to start uh, sort of seeing what we could do about it. Um, so that's my uh, PhD student to acknowledge him. Uh, anything you see that works and that's done well is uh, due to him. Anything that's bad and typos and everything, it's, it's my fault. Um, and I wanted to sort of start by saying nothing related to the talk, just talking about this. Uh, some of you may know about that I'm uh, on sabbatical here. It's been a fantastic experience. Uh, and I was excited to see the eclipse yesterday. So I just want to put a picture up there. Uh, <laughs> And uh, in particular, I would like to thank uh, the uh, my my hosts here that that have been agreed to to uh, host me during the sabbatical year, Claudio, Lima, and Enzo. Okay, so uh, this is going to be the outline of my talk. I'm just going to very briefly introduct uh, the uh, introduction to the topic, uh, and then I'm going to talk about the two problems uh, that we've worked on: the knapsack interdiction, uh, which was uh, an IPCO paper. Uh, last IPCO, uh, and then the current work that we're doing on minimum spending tree interdiction, uh, and then I'll have a conclusion. Okay, so uh, I, I've worked mainly on integer programming for a lot of time, and then so basic integer program is this that we've all seen. We want to minimize an objective function subject to linear constraints and uh, integrality constraints. Uh, but the key assumption that's inside this integer program is that there is a single guy or a single a being that can control all the decisions, right? There's a single uh, entity that can control everything that we do. Um, and that's often not the case, right? So there's uh, several situations where you can control only partially, uh, and then you have other people that are involved in taking decisions. Um, so it's not possible, for example, to coordinate the efforts. Uh, and so in the bi-level setting, uh, there is this, this extra decision maker that's involved. Uh, and so this is just to sort of start uh, uh, introducing notation. Uh, so we're going to use X as the upper level or leader uh, decisions. Uh, I'm going to use those uh, terms uh, interchangeably. And then we have some second decision maker that takes care of the decision Y. And there is a constraint that says that Y has to be the optimal solution to another uh, discrete problem or another optimization problem in general. It doesn't need to be uh, fully IP. Right, uh, but that that's the idea, right? Why is our optimal solutions to a second uh, optimization problem? Okay, uh, and the idea of, of how the model is going to go is that first I'm going to, as the upper level leader, uh, I'm going to take some decisions x, and then based on the decisions x, then y reacts to that, right? So y takes the optimal decisions subject to the decisions that uh, the upper level has taken. Okay. Uh, and then again, just to start uh, introducing some notation, I'm going to typically refer to the set of feasible solutions uh, to the upper level as this uh, script U, uh, and then the set of feasible solutions to the lower level as L of X, right? It's a function of the decisions of X. X, the decision first, uh, and then whatever is left to take the decision is a function of that. Okay, just to give you an idea how these things start becoming hard really fast, I'm just gonna show you sort of a very basic proof that this is hard even in the LP case. Right? What we have here, this is essentially the standard like continuous knapsack on the top, right? Uh, so X is just uh, continuous in zero one, but then Y is the optimal to this problem, right? So what happens here if X is fractional, then y can be something that's not zero. But if x is integral, it's either zero or one, then y is forced to be zero, right? And so with that, uh, with a, a big M large enough, and large enough doesn't need to be too large, it's just polynomial, what this says is that any optimal solution to this problem is going to be integral, right? Any x that optimizes this guy is going to be integral, and so all, all y's are going to be zero, so you're essentially solving the knapsack problem. Right? So 
This just shows that, okay, even if you assume everything is a linear program, it already becomes a hard problem to solve, right? Uh, and that was proven way a uh, long time ago, uh, but there are still actually questions that uh, people are asking and that, that has, hasn't been proved. There was a, this paper recently last year uh, just to even show that this is actually a problem in IT, okay? It's never for me. So we're gonna look at some special case of this, uh, of this bi-level problem, which is this uh, interdiction problem. And again, the idea is there that the, the upper level decision maker can choose to block or interdict some of the decisions that the lower level guy can take. And then the form of the problem becomes this. Uh, what's special about this, okay, this is again, upper level problem taking the decisions, lower level problem taking some other decisions. This block is not really formalized, but there is one key important thing here. All the upper level is trying to do is minimize the lower level objectives, right? So in bi-level in general, I could have different objectives on the upper and lower level. On this case, I'm just going to say, I want to make the follower's decision as bad as possible, okay? Um, and there's several applications for uh, this type of problem, right? So uh, one, I think, was uh, one of the original uh, uh, applications that, that uh, these types of problems was proposed to, but it's also in this uh, paper by Wood in 1993. So it's to sort of uh, try to, to hurt as much as possible uh, drug trade, right? So I'm assuming that the lower level guys, they're smart, they want to, to smuggle drugs. And then uh, this uh, drug smuggling operation uh, is modeled as a maximum flow. They want to maximize the flow of drugs. And then me as the upper level, I'm trying to make uh, the, the smuggler's life as hard as possible. So I want to minimize the maximum flow that they can do, right? Uh, and so this is just uh, an example of a picture of sort of drug flows uh, that could happen. And maybe I can choose to block some of these or either block or try to, I don't know, decrease capacity of some of these corridors, right? Uh, and, and that way uh, we can try to, to hurt as much as possible these bad players. Um, another example of, uh, of application of these uh, uh, interdiction type problems is uh, this paper by Asimakopoulos on 1987, uh, where they essentially studied uh, interdiction models to try to uh, reduce the spread of hospital infections. So they modeled several different types of interdictions that they could use in several uh, different stages uh, in, inside the hospital and seeing how that could be used to sort of reduce the spread of diseases uh, inside the hospital. Um, and then another, it's, it's sort of a, like a reverse look at, at the first one. I'm trying to see, okay, I have this, my optimization problem here, uh, which is essentially sort of an allocation of customers to capacitor facilities, right? And I wanna do that at minimum cost. And if I have unmet demand, uh, I can outsource it at a, an extra cost. Uh, and I want to see how resilient is my system to attacks, right? So if somebody tries to attack I mean, some of these facilities or some of these edges, what is that going to, how is that going to affect uh, my network or my optimization problem, right? So now I am actually the follower and I'm interested in seeing how my system is going to react to attacks, right? So to try to find uh, the resiliency of systems to attacks. So the upper level is some bad player that wants to hurt my system. Okay, um, any questions so far? I mean, also feel free to interrupt me at any point if you have questions. Um, this is just sort of a very brief glance on, on, on some of the applications uh, of introduction type problems. Okay, so what is the goal? Um, we started to look at this because I thought it was like fun problems, let's start to, to, to look at this and what we can do um, on this front. Uh, the title of the talk is this, is Fast Exact Algorithms for Some Interdiction Problems. So let me just sort of go ahead and, and talk to you and briefly mention sort of what this is about. Uh, first of all, what I mean fast is look at the ball clock and see how fast it is. It's nothing to do with polynomial time or anything like that. 
uh, fast is really CPU time. Right? And the key thing is that also some of the, the, the approaches that have been proposed before for, for some of our problems, uh, they were very slow, right? Granted, they were more general approaches uh, than, than what we, uh, we had proposed, uh, but they were slow. So we were like, okay, what can we do better, uh, particularly if we do uh, problem-specific approaches, right? Also, we're interested in exact algorithms, so I want to compute the real true optimal solution. Uh, so not going to compare to to any heuristic algorithms, uh, but also type of problems that we chose is some interdiction problems. I didn't want to focus on sort of like small variations of several different uh, small problems. We wanted to try to focus on some classic fundamental problems, uh, and that's what we did in this one. And the main thing is, is one of these things that that I had already mentioned. What are the overall questions that that we could do is can we push uh, how far along we can we can solve these problems by using problem specific algorithms, right? Instead of some general purpose solvers. Uh, but yeah, maybe you can argue that okay, these algorithms are not that useful. They're just for that specific problem. And then so we're can we sort of go back and try to extract ideas that were used for these problem specific uh, uh, type algorithms? Uh, and maybe learn something and try to see how they generalize into some slightly more general settings, okay? So that's sort of what uh, what we set out to do, and that's what I'm going to talk about in the context of these two problems. All right, so first problem that we solved was uh, this uh, knapsack interdiction uh, problem. So here is the, the, the setting of the problem. I'm given a set of weights sorry, a set of items, one through N. Uh, there's upper level weights, there's lower level weights, and there's uh, the profit of each item. Uh, there's an upper level capacity and there's a lower level capacity, right? So the upper level guy is trying to interdict subject to an abstract constraint. And the lower level guy is just solving a regular knapsack, except that the items may not be available, right? So if I have interdicted item I, it's not available to pick at the lower level, right? So that's the interdiction version of the problem. Uh, and then all I want is to minimize the, the follower's objective. Okay, is that clear? Um, just uh, a very brief discussion of uh, things that have been out there. Uh, some previous work, uh, including by, by Margarita and others. Uh, it's a sigma 2 p complete problem. Uh, essentially, it means unless weird things happen, there isn't even a polynomial size IP formulation for the problem. Uh, there is a PDAS for it uh, that, that was out in 2022. Uh, but again, we cannot have a, a pseudo polynomial time algorithm for it. Uh, and these were sort of the previous uh, versions uh, of the work. Um, and I think these are essentially just more general by level uh, type approaches. Uh, and this is sort of how far uh, the, these, uh, uh, these approaches were able to, to get before. Uh, the biggest winner before was this, this, uh, this, uh, this other uh, work that was also on IPCO. Uh, they can solve instances with up to 500 items. Uh, but incidentally, all of these rely on MIP solvers, right? And, and that's one thing that, that we had noticed is that, okay, everything sort of just formulates it as a MIP and do, does relaxation cuts or whatever it is. Um, and, and then uh, they, they, they get these types of results. Okay. So first thing I wanted to talk about uh, is how we do branching. Uh, we do branching in a very, very standard way. It's essentially just enumerating, right? I'm just doing at level i, I branch on if I pick variable i or not, right? And I do it in order, and I'm assuming uh, the usual sort of continuous knapsack order uh, of the weights, uh, the, the ratio between profits and weights, uh, the lower level weights. So in some sense, I'm looking at what the lower level would do, right? The lower level would probably find the first item more profitable and so on, right? And then I branch on this order. At that I minus one, I decide 
regardless of where I have rent before, I decide, do I pick this item or not? Okay. But essentially what this means is that a branch and bound node, if I'm at depth I minus one, it's identified by this X, right? By this history of which items did I pick or not pick up to this point, right? And this is, starts to look a little bit like uh, dynamic programming that we start, that, that we uh, wanted to do with, and that's what we sort of did uh, is use this, this, this type of structure. And that's why sort of this branching structure as well. So, okay. That's just branching, right? We branch, we could do complete enumeration, uh, that's done. Uh, now what we need is to have some way to bound this so that we can sort of prune our, our, our branching tree. So how do we compute the lower bound at a given branch and bound node? We use this information on, okay, X are the items that I have already interdicted up to one to I minus one. Uh, and then I is this current item that I decided to branch, right? So I do three things. Well, one is that I solve a lower level knapsack on the items that are left after I have interdicted X. And then I compute the lower bound for the rest, right? So the key thing is up to here, I have already decided. So I know what I interdicted. So lower level can just take the best decision possible, right? And then I'm separating that from anything that I'm deciding afterwards. And then I need to combine these two things into a bound that's valid for everybody. Okay, so how is this going to work? Uh, so this is just sort of to, to introduce some more notation. This is just the optimal solution to the knapsack, uh, lower level knapsack, assuming I have interdicted already all the items in X and the lower level capacity is C. Okay, so that's KXC. It's just that, it's just the regular knapsack for the lower level using capacity C. And so solving this lower nap level knapsack on these items is just this, right? I interdict everybody from I to N plus whatever I have already interdicted up to I minus one. And then I'm assuming I'm using a fixed capacity small C. And then I compute a lower bound for everything else. So this is just sort of the notation of the lower bound. I haven't told you yet how to compute that, but this is the property that I want to satisfy, right? This is a lower bound that's going to depend on two quantities, the upper level and the lower level capacity, right? Which is again, sort of giving you a hint that what I'm doing is sort of dynamic programming type of thing. What I want is to satisfy this inequality. It has to be a lower bound on everybody, right? Everybody that I interdict afterwards. Okay, so all the children of that node essentially, right? Because that's, those are the children is everything else. Okay, uh, and then CU here is just the upper level capacity that I can use. CL here is the lower level capacity. That I can use. And so combining this into a lower bound for the descendants means what is the lower bound for the descendants is this. Right? It's just this minimum of all the lower level knapsacks subject to this is feasible for my problem and whatever I have branched on at the end is exactly X, right? My current bound, right? Up to this point, it's X and then I could, could branch it in different directions, okay? So with that, we can prove uh, this result. Uh, essentially, how do I combine one and two is these two. If I can solve the lower level capacities up to item, the lower level knapsacks up to item I minus one, and then I have that lower bound, it is a lower bound for all the descendants of the node. Okay, so red plus blue less than or equal to purple. Um, I'm not going to go uh, through the proof in detail, but I'm just going to give you the idea. What are we doing here? So hopefully this will, will give you a little bit of, of a better intuition of, of how this bound was obtained. Uh, I'm looking at this in this way. I have branched on these guys, right? The red items, right? 
up to here is a decision that I've already taken up to this note. These are the guys that I've already decided to interdict. This is whatever is going to come after, after I branch uh, later on this node. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the following. I'm going to assume that I split the capacity. I pre-allocate small c units of the capacity to this side of the knapsack. And then whatever is left, I can use on the rest of the knapsack. Okay? Obviously, this is not a very good thing to do. This this pre-allocation of the split is not better than just solving the knapsack on every item, right? So that's how we get the lower bound. But this pre-allocation of the items allows us to do this result. Notice that this says that for any particular pre-allocation of this capacity, right, I get a lower bound. So I can check for all of these, which one is the best one, and that's it, right? So I'm just pre-splitting the capacity items up to here, and then items up to there, and then I can combine them into a lower bound. Oh, you choose C. Yeah, I don't choose. Okay. I, any of these is a valid lower bound, so I just pick the best lower bound. Okay. Okay. Yep. Yeah. yeah. All right, so that's the idea of it. So how do we get this lower bound, right? This is great as long as I can get this part, right? This was the hard part is how do I compute uh, this lower bound? That's the property that I want to be able to satisfy. Um, and the main idea for that is use this, uh, WWGD, which is essentially what would a greedy algorithm do, okay? So, here, what am I doing? I'm assuming I'm at the branch and bound node here. I've decided everything up to node I. And then I'm going to decide either I'm going to interdict that uh, next item I, or I'm not going to interdict that next item I, right? If I interdict, there's nothing for left for uh, the lower level guy to do. I interdict it, he cannot pick that guy, right? So the only thing that he can do is this, just move on to the next guy. Since I decided to interdict, I reduce my capacity, my upper level capacity. Lower level guy cannot do anything, right? It just stays the same. Or I didn't interdict that guy. In this case, well, since I'm doing greedy, if I can, right? So if I can still fit that item in the knapsack, the greedy is going to pick that guy, always, right? So this is what it's doing. I didn't decide to interdict, so I don't lose as the upper level capacity. But the greedy decides to pick that guy, so it uses that amount of capacity, but it also gains that amount of profit. Okay? And so that's it. I do this dynamic programming recursion. Now this is essentially just a dynamic programming recursion. Okay? I compute this whole dynamic programming table. I have all of these items here, right, for every choice of I, CU, and CL. Okay, that's the main idea. It's very simple. The key thing here, uh, and that that we like, it took us just some time to figure out, uh, is that we could assume that the lower level guy actually does a very particular strategy. It does what greedy does, right? Which is sort of weird. We're looking and we're we're trying to do a relaxation. Uh, which is what we typically do as, a, I mean, at least I was used to do as, as an IP person. Um, so you typically don't assume something more restrictive, but in this case, that's what we do. There is a heuristic, a greedy heuristic. Let's assume that that guy does the uh, greedy heuristic, the lower level. And by assuming that we can exploit that very particular uh, strategy for the lower level, okay? And then be able to compute its bounds. <clears throat> Right, so that's the idea. The follower always takes item I. We can improve that a little bit and allow the follower to be a little bit smarter and say, well, if I interdict, sure, there's nothing else for the follower to do. But if I don't interdict, let me allow the follower to either pick that guy, which was this line before, or to also not pick that guy. Right, so I can do a little bit better. So the follower can be a little bit smarter in their choices. Uh, and in that sense, it, it sort of 
looks like uh, we're taking uh, several rounds of a game, right? Where we're saying, okay, the leader takes the action of branching, then the follower takes another action, and then the leader takes another action of branching and so on, and they follow this sort of two end rounds of, 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 of a game, yeah. So here, uh, here in this uh, dynamic programming formulation, yeah. then, then the, 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 the the heuristic is that you have pre-committed uh, in a way how you will uh, uh, how the how the leader is playing. Is it like that? How the follower is playing, not the leader. As a follower, I'm just doing the branch and bound decisions. But then after that, I'm I'm pre-committing to the leader, no, sorry, the follower who's always doing the strategy. Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay, so that's the result, right? So for, for any of these, either it's the, this, the greedy one or the improved one, this gives us what we wanted, which is this lower bound, and then everything changes. Uh, and this is what I had just mentioned. This is, there's like two different interpretations. One is just like looking from this uh, heuristic point of view, uh, where the, the follower, uh, they just take some heuristic strategy, which we know in advance, uh, but also there is this other interpretation, which we're not entirely sure how we can generalize, but we thought it was interesting, where uh, for in order to obtain a bound for a two-level game, we actually sort of relax it to a two-end level game, but where each one of the levels is very simple, right? So it allows us to do this, this type of uh, bound computing, where we, we have a multiple level game, which could be harder, but since each level is very simple, everything stays on. Um, that's mainly uh, what we did. There's other uh, stuff that we did also, but I think the, these are sort of the main ingredients that I wanted to talk about. Uh, but this is just sort of some side note that we sort of uh, wanted to, to show. I mean, we didn't find this uh, anywhere. Maybe somebody else has proven this. What this essentially says is the following. Uh, it's a hard problem to solve these bi-level problems, but whatever we did was based on assuming that the lower level has a good heuristic. Well, what are provably good heuristics are approximation algorithms. So this essentially says this. If I have sort of an alpha approximation algorithm for the follower, right, the second level guy, and I can solve to optimality this problem, instead of my original problem, I use this approximate solution to the follower, then I also am guaranteed to get an alpha approximation for my whole problem, okay? That's essentially what this is saying. Uh, it's just a curiosity for now. I, I don't know if it's going to be useful, but I thought that maybe there is context where this could be useful. This could become an easier problem to solve, okay? So let's move on to sort of the, the, the computational tests that we did. Uh, we only compare against uh, this DCS, uh, which is the De La Mata and uh, De La Croce and Saramaccia. I hope I'm not butchering that much, the names, uh, which was essentially the previous best for uh, from the literature. Uh, these were sort of all the, the benchmark instances that they tested on. Uh, this is the number of times the optimal solution was obtained by that algorithm. This is number of times where that algorithm was the best, uh, then average and maximum computational times, and this is for our output, right? Uh, essentially, we beat them in pretty much everything except some of the uncorrelated, which are essentially the easiest instances anyway. Uh, but even then, we still take at most six seconds. Uh, computational times are significantly reduced in several instances. Get the average time here from 800 to 24 seconds. Okay, uh, so this was like, quite a big surprise. We were hoping that we would get good results, but this was like uh, very, very, very good uh, in our opinion. So uh, that's just to give you an idea. I mean, it, and even in the harder instances, we branch a lot, but the root gap is like really small. Right? It's uh, 1%, or uh, 1, 2%, okay? Uh, so we essentially just spend the whole time trying to prove that it's all. Uh, this is just to show, again, similar trends. This is a performance profile. I'm not going to bug you to what that is. Essentially, upper is better uh, for different versions of our algorithm, depending on what we do. 
trying to see, okay, what actually made the algorithm work? Uh, it turns out that yes, some of the things like, do make a bigger difference, but any variation of this, this branch and bound algorithm that we did uh, beats the previous one, which is the blue by a significant margin. Yes. Just get back to the previous slide. Yeah. Um, so I guess the implementation is really important because uh, on some of the lines you store a very large number of nodes, but still the average computing time is two or one second. Correct. Uh, yes. Second to last line, the average time is 0.6 seconds, but still you're exploring 2.5 million nodes. Yeah, that's one of the key things. I think that that's one of the key things that helps us is that this table of the lower bounds, which is what we need, we can do it once in advance, period. And then we just reuse this table just as like, I just need to consult a number. That's all I need to, to get the lower bounds. I don't need to solve an LP. That it's like lightning fast, right? Once I've completed this table. Right, it's it's a single time effort that I can reuse throughout my branch and bound tree. Mm -hmm. Is it is it that this this uh, lower bound is very uh, relaxed? Is it not tight? Yeah. Actually, it is very tight. I, I I omitted that slide. It's it's towards the end. It's actually really tight in most cases. So your upper bound is not tight. Why 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 did you explore a lot of nodes? So this is is. These are instances essentially where the gap are really, really low. Uh, it's really all we need is like try to find maybe like there's a one no. unit of difference between the optimal and, and the current known. And yeah, we just need to break that down. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, this is also one one thing that we thought, okay, maybe that's like an influence of number of threads. We were trying to uh, run this originally with 16 threads, and we got a question saying maybe well, this, is it like a function of threads? So we did this test. Even our version of the algorithm with single thread beats the version of the previous algorithm with 16 threads. So it's, it's definitely not. Uh, obviously, threads help, but we still beat them with, with one thread. Um, so that was the results that we had for um, knapsack interdiction. Uh, so then we started saying, okay, what can we do uh, in some other problems? And then we started working on this uh, minimum spanning tree interdiction problem. So the setting here is is similar. We have edge weights that are they're ordering the usual minimum spanning tree order. Uh, Ws are the weights of the, uh, of the edges of our graph. Uh, and then their capacities, the upper level, again, just respects an upside constraint. The lower level is trying to obtain a minimum spanning tree. Okay? <coughs> Subject to obviously not picking anyone that I've already um, it's related to sort of this K most vital edges problem. The K most vital edges is, is, is all of these are one. Um, it was already shown to be strongly empty heart. Um, there is a, an alternative uh, for a formulation for the, the interdiction minimum spanning tree where I think you minimize the cost subject to being, uh, uh, being able to increase your, your minimum spanning tree weight by at least some amount, right? Uh, that was the one study of this work. Uh, there are approximation algorithms. I think the best one is this one, which I think is a four approximation uh, for the problem, uh, but it's still a, a really hard problem to solve. Okay, so what did we do? Uh, one thing that we said, well, we, we had this thing and, and, and a lot of why it worked, I think, is because we had this like, dynamic programming, easy to compute bound. Can we do something like this? Uh, in this uh, in this minimum spanning tree setting. So that's what we try to do. Uh, and so we're assuming this. Now we have this GIR be again an upper bound of the increase in the minimum spanning tree cost, right? So the notation here is again, what is the minimum spanning tree uh, on this graph after I've interdicted this edge I uh, versus the version that I didn't interdict this edge I. Right, so what's the increase on the minimum spanning tree cost, given that I've already taken some branching decisions x, and now I'm 
trying to figure out, do I interdict this extra edge I or do I not interdict? And again, R is just relating to the capacity that I'm left over on the map side. And you can think of this as like a, like a discrete derivative, right? What's the effect of just doing that single operation of interdicting that edge uh, or not? It's going to have some increase in cost, right? So uh, I want to compute this upper bound on the increase in cost, right? By the way, it's, it's flipped around because before I was, we, we were doing a min-max, now we're doing a maximum. That's why we have upper bound here. <clears throat> but again, assuming we have this version uh, of the bound, then we can do again uh, a, a knapsack like DP, right? Which is just saying uh, I either have this bound if I decide to not do anything, or I can interdict that guy, uh, and then that causes an increase of the minimum spanning tree cost of at most this one, okay? So once I have this, I can compute again a diamond programming table that stores all my bounds and that allows me to use these bounds inside the range of bound. <clears throat> uh, and that's it, that, that's our sort of knapsack-like DP as long as I can compute this. If I have that, if I have this, this knapsack like DP, then under this, under a connectedness assumption, which again, if it's not connected then it's easy, uh, then this gives me an upper bound on the optimal solution to the problem. Okay, and, and I can extend that upper bound again. After I've branched a lot, so I can use all of these uh, in, in this recursive way. Um, and you have, I have, how many minutes? Uh, like you can ten. Okay. Uh, so I think I have time to go over this just to give you an idea. So how bad can this be? Uh, how bad can this this upper bound be? Um, and uh, hopefully this also help understand a bit better the problem. Let's suppose that I have uh, this instance here. Uh, the number on the left is sort of the, the, the interdiction cost or, or the interdiction budget that this uh, interdicting this out consumes. Uh, the number on the right is the minimum spending tree cost, right? So I typically, I would like to pick, at the lower level would like to pick all the zero cost edges, but these guys consume a lot of my budget. I cannot essentially interdict any one of these guys with infinity, right? Uh, so, if I look at this problem here and suppose I have a capacity of 2K minus one, what's gonna be the optimal solution to this, right? I would like to force this guy to use because that guy has a huge cost of M. That, that means that the minimum spending tree will have to use that. But the only way that I can force that guy to use if I interdict this and that, right? Otherwise, it's gonna either pick this guy if it's available or it's gonna pick that guy, which is still available. Right? So I need to interdict these two, and that will cause me the weight of what M in the minimum spending tree, but I can only do that once, right? This consumes K of my budget, and I can't consume more than two K minus one, right? So that means that I can consume one extra guy of this, which means the minimum spending tree will pick this second guy, and then that's it, I'm done, I cannot consume anything else, I cannot interdict anything else, so the minimum spending tree will have weight big M plus one. Okay, but what is this GIR that I just mentioned doing? This is looking at the effect of only interdicting that single edge, right? And the problem with that is that, okay, if I only interdict that single edge, maybe I can cause the, the minimum spending tree to increase by a lot, right? So, and you can show that this is essentially what you, you can do is I can cause the minimum spending tree cost to increase by almost capital M, but then if I compute that dynamic programmer recursion, that's gonna have a cost of essentially this much, K and minus one plus one, which is much larger than the actual optimal solution, right? So this bound can be bad, right? Uh, but it happens that it turns out that uh, it starts becoming bad on instances where there's, a lot of structure already, right? It's very sparse instances. 
And for those instances, essentially, you can just branch as hell, and, and it solves fast, right? For the more dense instances, that's where this bound starts becoming uh, less, uh, less bad, uh, and then it helps us a lot, OK? Uh, this is not something we could prove. It's just something that we tried, and it actually worked. Uh, worked out that way. This is something we observed. Um, so how do we compute that bound, which is, again, the, the, the crucial part? Uh, how do we compute this upper bound on how much the minimum, sp minimum spanning tree weight increases? Uh, the idea is, again, just using WWKD. Now, what would Crisco do? Right Now, I can assume that, sure, I know minimum spanning tree algorithms, but I'm going to assume that I have a very specific one that's running. Uh, so first of all, if we note, let's suppose that I have the graph and I've added all the edges of 2i minus 1, and I'm trying to decide on this edge, uh, EI here, do I interdict that guy or do I not interdict that guy? Uh, if I compute the minimum cut without this red edge, and the minimum cut is, uh, it doesn't show there, but the, the, the budget that I have in the, 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 the knapsack is C minus R. So if the minimum cut cannot be cut off right, with, uh, with C minus R edges, what does that mean? It means that when I reach this point of the minimum spanning tree algorithm, there is no way that I could have cut off U and G. So U and G are already connected. So Crisco doesn't add this edge. So interdicting that edge does nothing for me because Crisco is not going to pick that edge already. Right? So EIR can be set to zero in that case. OK? So now I'm going to assume that that doesn't happen, which is this case here. So the minimum cut can be interdicted with the upper level capacity. So all I'm going to do now is, well, who is this guy going to be replaced with? Right? So I need to figure out one of the next guys who is going to replace it. And all I need to do is start looking at minimum cuts. I need to start looking. These are sort of the edges that have come before. This is the current edge that I'm trying to decide, do I interdict or not? And these are the edges that are come later, the blue edges. Right? So up to this point, well, I can still maybe disconnect these two, uh, <clears throat> these two vertices. So I'm not sure if Crusco would pick this guy or not. Uh, and then I keep adding. And then I keep adding. And at this point, I'm assuming that whatever is left is just two. If I reach this point of the algorithm, the Kruskal's algorithm, there is no way, again, that I could have disconnected U and V without touching any of the blue edges. Right? So I'm setting uh, the, uh, the weights of the blue edges to infinity, so I'm not avoiding those. So I want to try to avoid the blue edges, but I still cannot disconnect U and V, which means at that point, it doesn't matter what the decisions X I have taken, Crusco will have already either connected U and V, or if it hasn't connected, then I could add this last blue edge, right? Which means that that guy is, at the worst case, I'm going to be adding this guy to my minimum spend. Right? And since the edges are ordered in non-decreasing uh, order of weights, that's uh, an upper bound that I can consider. It's, it's WK minus W. OK, so this is the very, very simple idea uh, of, of the algorithm, what we can do, how to compute uh, this GIR. Uh, this is the algorithm, which I don't expect you to understand, just sort of to to give you a very brief glance that nothing we do here is, is a, an expensive operation. The main thing we do here is compute min cuts and then the rest is, is easy operations, right? Uh, so again, this is a very fast bound that we can do. Uh, we did computational experiments. So we can adapt our algorithm to this uh, edge blocker version that was uh, done by this way of this and Fajo. Uh, we don't have like that extensive uh, type results, but here you already can see these are like two different versions of our algorithm. And this is the best uh, of the previous work. And in smaller instances, probably not that big a deal. But if you start looking at times, we're always under a second. Uh, they take hours. Okay. Uh, 
Another uh, comparison we did is uh, by this other work uh, in 2012, uh, which I think was the K-mosidal K edges. Uh, and then it says in small instances, not that big a deal, larger instances, it goes from two hours to 60 seconds. Okay. So these seem to be working really well. Uh, a few extra comments. There, there is also this uh, very recent PhD thesis in 2024 that does uh, some uh, experiments on, on uh, uh, different formulations for the, the introduction, MSD introduction problem. We haven't directly compared to them yet, but from what we've seen, I think we probably will still uh, come out on top. Their computational science seems to be in line with the previous work. Uh, we also can extend this to sort of more general matroids. MST, you can see it as a matroid problem. So we can actually do sort of matroid interdiction type problems. Um, and then on that context, we have some more theoretical result, but that's sort of getting very, very technical. So I, I chose to skip. I think this gives us sort of the main ideas uh, of the algorithm. Uh, and that's pretty much uh, what I wanted to say. Um, Again, just sort of recapping what we did, the key ideas I think that, that we, we were able to exploit is that we have very, very fast lower bounds and that they can be obtained by assuming that the lower level guy has a very specific strategy that we know and we can exploit, right? Possibly heuristic, it doesn't need to be optimal. So I, for example, I do greedy, right? So greedy is not optimal for the map set, but it's something we know in advance. Uh, there is this idea, I think, that, that could still be useful of, of transforming this uh, two-round game into a two-end round of a much simpler game, uh, which may be useful. Uh, and again, this is, is what allows us our, our lower bound computational to be fast uh, and also very, uh, very fast to, to, to compute and to, um, and to use. Uh, and for the, the minimum spanning tree in particular, we use this sort of discrete derivative idea of what is the effect of doing this single item interdiction. Uh, and then we can apply that to, to, to obtain global lower bounds for a prediction problem. Overall, I think this is a very important topic. Uh, there's been increasing interest in, in these types of problems. There's very theoretically challenging and computationally challenging. Um, by exploiting the structure, we were able to get much faster algorithms. Um, I think this says that I mean, we can uh, compute even sigma 2 p hard problems in reasonable time, or reasonably large problems. Okay, and that's it. So thank you very much for your attention.